life, and I appreciate him very much. Amen. He has been uh, just a great source of strength to us through the years. Amen. I followed him. He passed in an old Mogi a few years before I did, and, and I realized real quick I needed a because every time I turned around, the whole church was talking about Brother Hale, what he had done there. It was the high water mark. Amen. So I figured I better get acquainted with this Brother Hale. And I'm glad I did. Amen. That's been several years ago. I'm glad I did. He serves on our board. He's an elder in my life, and we're very honored to have him here tonight. Would you put your hands together and welcome Bishop Hale. Amen. Let's love the Lord, everybody. Let's give the Lord great praise tonight. He is so worthy. You know that? He is so worthy. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. God bless you. You may be seated tonight. I'm always aware about these kind of meetings, especially the store conference meeting. Strategic Teaching on Revival and Evangelism. And uh, the great dream that Brother Morgan had about the general store. I'm sure you've heard so much about it. It's good tonight to be here with my wonderful influence in my life, Sister Mangan. I love her. She's been quite an example, impacted me and my wife over the years. And when my wife heard Sister Mangan was going to be here, she really got upset at me. said, how come you didn't tell me Sister Mangan is going to be there? I said, well, I just found that out myself. That was about a week ago. And uh, I'm so thankful. Brother Mark Morgan, of course, we love and appreciate Brother Morgan, what he does for the kingdom of God, unselfish, his family. I love and appreciate them. They get reminded before the throne of God every day, every day, every one of them. Amen. Amen. And all of you wonderful preachers, Brother Hughes, all of you wonderful preachers that are here tonight. Thank you for coming. I want to get right into this message tonight. I'm not I'm gonna try my best not to preach at you, okay? I want somehow or another to share with you. I feel like a, a message from the Lord. I don't know what uh, I'm, I'm going to call this the, the law of the situation. There is such a law, the law of the situation. And I'm going to read to you from the Old Testament a little story that you probably don't read too much. If you read it, you will skip right over and go on about your business. But I feel like it's got something to tell us tonight. My heart burns. I'm not getting any younger. I get to seeing things and feeling things, and I want somehow or another to do something to help people. I don't want you and I to get involved in the wrong war, okay? I don't want us to forget what this battle really is all about. And so let me read to you from the 23rd chapter of 1 Samuel, verse 1. Then they told David, saying, Behold, the Philistines fight against Keilah, and they rob the threshing floors. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, and saying, Shall I go and smite these Philistines? And the Lord said unto David, Go and smite the Philistines, and save Keilah. And David's men said unto him, Behold, we be afraid here in Judah. How much more, then, if we come to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? And then David inquired of the Lord yet again, and the Lord answered him and said, Arise, 
Go down to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistines into thine hand. So David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines, brought away their cattle and smote them with a great slaughter. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. Now I want you to hold that little story because we're going we're gonna to go there in just a moment. Yesterday, my little grandson, couldn't, he couldn't hide his excitement. He had just come from school and began to tell me what had happened that day. They had to wear a tie and all of that to school that day because they had a special guest. The guest that they had that took up most of the time was a survivor of the Holocaust. And uh, the man began to tell them what he had gone through. He was in his 80s, and he was 10 years of age when all of this happened. I've not, uh, I've not lived through some of the things that these individuals have gone through, but I actually have studied quite a bit about what went on in World War II, and especially in Eastern Europe. I went to Russia right after the... Berlin Wall had crumbled, and the Iron Curtain was coming down, and so the whole nation was kind of involved in wondering what we're supposed to be doing and how we're supposed to act now and what are we going to do. They basically had a carryover, and people were still being harassed. As a matter of fact, some of the large meetings that we went to to have a, a time of preaching we were warned very carefully, do not show any kind of emotion. The oppressive communist government would usually send secret police in to these places, and you could spot them pretty easily because they would not pray, and they would uh, keep their eyes open, and they were observing and, and looking to see what would take place in those meetings. But uh, I know that's different now. But... Here's the story. September 1st, 1939, Adolf Hitler started World War II. He had provoked a whole lot of speculation and things that should have alerted people, but in 1939, he broke his treaty there with Poland and invaded that country. And uh, unfortunately, Poland was between Germany and Russia, and he overpowered Poland swept through their weak army and uh, unprepared army. They, had, they were no match whatever to the proficient war machine there of the German soldiers. And this, of course, was the place of the concentration camps and where the Jews died. The Nazis ruled Poland, and they were killing the Jews. But when they would come through the nation of Poland... They would stop at the border uh, of Russia because uh, Hitler had made a treaty there with Stalin. He had told them, Stalin, of course, being the other man that is the greatest mass murderer in the history of the world, along with Adolf Hitler. Uh, Hitler said, we'll divide Poland up and uh, we will not attack you ever. Of course, he didn't care a thing in the world about Joseph Stalin. He was bidding his time. He had already overpowered Poland, and then on the other side of Germany, he had destroyed uh, the armies of France and Belgium, and he was trying to bomb England into submission at that time. And without any warning, without any warning whatsoever, Adolf Hitler broke his treaty with Stalin and went into Russia. The German army was so efficient, so proficient, highly trained and mechanized that the Russians were not ready at all. They had thought they were very safe, but with Poland already owned by the Nazis, they struck Russia and devastated that country. Nobody could stop the Germans. Their tanks, their airplanes, their rapid advance of their army caused the Russian people to do the only thing they could do. And it became very problematic to the Nazis. They retreated. 
and they retreated, and they retreated. Russia is a country so massive that it has somewhere around seven or eight time zones. We have three or four, and so you can imagine what it was. The cities were getting run over. The women were assaulted and raped and abused, and the pillage and carnage was unbelievable. It was so horrible. But there was nothing that Russia could do but just wait for another day and try to get some men to come and help them. They could let millions die because they had millions more. And so they kept retreating. But what happened is that Germany had began to extend their supply lines from Germany. Now they had gone all the way across Poland. Now they were making their inroads into Russia. But the fall had turned into late fall. And now they thought they had, would win by early fall, but Russia kept retreating and kept retreating. And the longer the food lines got and were extended, the harder it became for these German troops and soldiers. The Russians started burning their food, and they started blowing up their town so the Germans would not have any food. Now, now they're getting further and further away from Germany. Then, I say by the providence of God, winter came very early that year, and all the Germans had was their spring and their summer outfits against a Russian winter. If you've ever been in a Russian winter, you'd understand. Now it's so cold and there's a shortage of food, and the Germans are freezing in the snow, and the supply lines are too thin. The Germans, I mean the Russians who had been waiting and waiting and suffering, did something then which cracked everything about the equation. They finally said, you know, enough is enough. We have run and we have retreated. We're going to fight back. We're going to fight back. They had been retreating, but now they had gotten enough troops and weapons and built some of the tanks of their own, and with the Germans freezing in their summer outfits, the soldiers came out of the snow and started to attack the German armies. The Germans said, you dare to attack us? How dare you to do that? But the Russians did that. They killed many of the Germans, and they encircled the rest of them. Some of the most brutal fighting known in history took place. Because of what Germany had done to the Russian people, the Russians were so pent up and so full of poison and vengeance that they wanted somehow to destroy every German they saw. History tells us that when they went after the Germans, the carnage was unspeakable. But it turned when they stopped retreating and started uh, to attack instead of just defending now take that little story and put it in your mind tonight. And then I pick the Bible story up of David. I want to tell you, if you don't understand this little part of the story, the chapter will mean absolutely nothing to you tonight. At this time, David had about 400 men, and he was totally isolated King Saul, as you know, was chasing him down everywhere. He was like a little rabbit running from one place to another to hide from some coyote, trying his best to stay alive. He is constantly on the move, and he can't even stay in one place. And he constantly is inquiring of God, God, where am I supposed to go and what am I supposed to do? And how am I going to live? Because I don't know without your help if I'm going to even survive. And so God keeps him one step ahead of Saul and the army of Israel. But this puts incredible, tremendous pressure on David. Stay with me, please. On top of all that, he knows he's being hated for no reason whatsoever. And just the mental... The pressure of that, the intense pressure that that has. David has no country, no man. He's, he's a, a man without a country. 
And on top of that, he's got 400 men that are rejects of society that he's got to do his very best to make sure that they are taken care of. He can't go home. He can't go to his wife. He can't go to his parents. He don't even know where the next meal is going to come from. I want you to get this in your thinking tonight. These people gathered around him, of course, because they knew the Lord had anointed David. He became their champion. They are now on the run, living in caves in the desert, don't have a clue how they're going to be able to feed 400 men and have no nice beds to live in. So, looking at it from that standpoint, David's in a mess. He's in a mess. Intense pressure of every kind you can think of. Physical pressure, mental pressure, spiritual pressure, emotional pressure. Pressure. In fact, when you read in the Psalms, and you will read the Psalms when you get in the valley, when you read the Psalms, you will find that it was all written at a time when David is going through what I'm talking about right now. Amen. It's because David's in a mess. He's in a storm. Oh, God, my God, I cry out to you. You're my sword and my buckler. You're my shield. You're my rock. You're my protector. You're my pavilion. You're my refuge. Oh, God, I cannot make it without you. How many times have I prayed some of those same prayers? And that's what makes this story so ridiculous tonight, because in the middle of that kind of situation and under that kind of pressure, David hears about a little town that needs salvation. It's been encircled by the Philistines. And back in those days, one of the things the enemy forces would do would be to wait for harvest season to come. When you would harvest your grain, it would be ready to be turned into bread and food. They would come down then, of course, and attack you just for the food source. So now it's harvest season, and the Philistines have encircled this Jewish town of Keilah, and David hears about it under the situation he's already in. He hears about this and how doomed these people are, and they're going to starve to death, and it's going to be an easy victory for the enemy. And so David, somehow, when he hears of this, there's something inside of him that I hope is inside of every one of you tonight. I hope it's inside of me. Lord, I know what I'm going through. I know what's happening in my life, and it looks like I might not even live very long but I'd like to know, do you really want me to fight your battle? Do you want me to get involved in this and fight the Philistines and save Keilah? When he asked that, that horrible, horrible storm began to overwhelm him again, mentally, physically, spiritually, everywhere you can think. Do you think you've got pressure? You think about what David is under at that time. Everybody's trying to kill him. God, shall I attack the Philistines in Keilah? God says, yes, I want you to go and do it. He comes back to tell his men. Now, just stay with me. I'm going to preach it about five minutes long tonight. Amen. I'm just building this up for your mind and your thinking. God, uh, he says, I, uh, do you want me to go? Yes, I want you to go. And he comes to his men. Guys, uh, get ready. We're fixing to go and save Keala. We're going to attack them barbaric Philistines. We're going to set free those people, those that are trying to rip off their food and surround them and starve them to death and kill and pillage them. We're going to go and attack. When he tells them that, they say, David, have you lost your mind? Have you lost your mind? We're being chased everywhere. We're living in caves. We don't even know when we're going to eat and what we're going to eat. We have no idea how we're going to live. And you, you know that we're people without a country ourselves. How in the world are you going to get involved in another battle that really is not your battle to start with? Amen. We've got 400 men, and you've got the whole army of Israel fighting against you and looking for you. And then on top of that, the Philistines are looking for you. 
you want us to go and attack the Philistines and save some little town? He said, you, they said, you don't have any relatives in that town. You, it, me, it means nothing to you. How come you're going to get involved in something that is not your business? And David said, uh, he went back to God. And he said, God, I told the men what you said. And um, they didn't like the idea at all. Are you sure you want me to go? And God says, that's my battle. That's my fight. I want you to go. Amen. David, in love with God, in the middle of all of his turmoil. David in the valley and trying his best to keep his head above water. David just trying to survive. I hope you get the picture tonight. And somehow in all of that, he says, you know what? This is God's battle. I've got to make sure I get involved in that. If I get involved in that, I believe the Lord's going to take care of everything else for me. I believe the Lord's going to handle everything else for me. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. People would say, David, you're just lucky to be alive, and now you're going to go and pick a fight with people that's looking for you. That's pretty crazy, isn't it? Think about how crazy that is tonight. Barely alive, doesn't know how long he's going to live, and now to start a war with some little town. His men would say, that's their problem, that's not your problem. But David reminds them, listen, you know and I know that God's battle is number one. I can live or not live, but if I can fight God's battle, God told me if I'd go, He'd go with me. That's all I want to know is God is going to be with me. That's all I want to know is the Lord going to fight with me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so they go down to Keilah. You know the story how they were successful and God delivered that little nation or that little city. The children, the parents eat the food that belongs to them. Instead of dying, they live. And instead of being assaulted, they're protected all because one man on the run himself and under intense pressure dares to attack and fight the Lord's battle. Now, I'm going to preach at you now. This is my whole subject tonight. This is my whole reason I believe the Lord brought me through a time of heart attack and all of that. I've asked the Lord why. This is what I feel He wants me to say tonight. David has a philosophy of life. And that is, I want to fight God's battle. I don't want to get involved in other battles. I don't want my personal battles to be involved here. I don't want to fight vengeful and retaliate because of what someone said or what someone did. I don't want my battles to get involved. I want to fight the Lord's battle. Now, everybody here has got to hear what I'm fixing to tell you. This stirs my heart so much when I think about it. If you were to look in the Old Testament, you will find where Josiah, you remember eight-year-old Josiah becoming king, great, 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 great revivalist. I don't think there's anybody else that you will find in the Old Testament that has brought greater revival to a nation than Josiah did. Sixteen years of age, he tears down the grove. Twenty-four years of age, he finds the, 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 the book of the law. And while they're cleaning up the temple, you find Josiah being used of God in such a great measure. A revivalist, yes he is, fighting the Lord's battle. But guess what happens? He gets to be 39 years of age now. 39 years of age, and... And uh, the king of Egypt comes, Nico by the name, and going to fight a battle. And the Scripture says, the Scripture says this. He's going to Carchemish, and Josiah decides, I'm going to get involved in this battle in some measure. And, and, and Nico says, Josiah, I don't want you to be able to fight against me. I don't have a fight with you. I, I, this is the Lord's business. The, the, Joe, uh, Nico said the Lord spoke out of his mouth, 
and told me to go fight this battle. I'm not wanting you to fight with me. I don't want to get involved in your battle. And, uh, and Josiah said, I'm going to fight against you. I'm going to fight you anyway. He says, don't be meddling. This is what Nico said. Don't be meddling with God. Don't get involved in something that's not your battle. I have to tell the preachers here tonight and saints of God, you better be careful about whose battle you start fighting. You get involved in things that you don't need to be involved with and get away from what the Lord has called us to do and the Lord's battle. And that's saving the lost. That's saving the lost. That's redemption. That's what our battle is all about. Don't you get involved in other things that will take you away from that. Hallelujah. 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 Why in the world did the Lord put that little story there in the Old Testament? I believe that all Scripture is profitable. Scripture says it's by inspiration of God. There's got to be some reason. I could take that story out. I could still believe Acts 2.38, and I could be saved. I believe that. But there's a reason the Lord put that in there because it's a lesson for you and I tonight. Here's a man of God that loves the cause and kingdom of God so much that he lays down his own problems and struggles and everything he's going in and has the philosophy of life. That's what I want to preach to you and me tonight, that we need a philosophy of ministry. We need a philosophy of ministry. We need to understand that this is a concept and principles to conduct our entire life. That's what Webster says uh, philosophy is, is to have a conduct for life. Dear God, give that to me tonight. I believe that's what David had because a little later on a woman by the name of Abigail said, David... Do you know why you're going to be king? You are going to be king. You know that. But do you know why you're going to be king? It's because you look past the bad things that's in your life, and you're willing to fight the Lord's battle. You're willing to fight the Lord's battle. Can anybody hear what I'm saying in this room tonight? Can anybody feel the presence of God right now, bringing that to our thinking and to our mind? Come on, let's lift our hands, everybody. Let's pray right now. Let's thank the Lord. Let's love the Lord. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 You may be seated. Praise God. I wish someone had told me when I got in the ministry a long time ago. I wish somebody would have told me that all preachers need a philosophy for their ministry. Webster says a philosophy is a particular system of principles for the conduct of life. Jesus made it pretty clear. Luke 14 and 28, he said, For which of you, intending to build a tower, Sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it. Both brothers and sisters, it takes as much faith or more to figure out what you're going to do and how you're going to do it before you get started, as it does to hit the panic button later on. How about us deciding, God, I want to make sure I've got a philosophy that I'm going to follow after and all the other battles that's going on around that. I'm not going to get diverted to that, but I'm going to keep this in mind. I've got a philosophy to reach the lost. That's right. I want to save. There's some key olives that comes by every once in a while. There's some people that I can reach out and rescue, and I want to be able to do that. Let me tell somebody tonight about the young lady that came through the prayer line some time ago. And uh, when she was asked, what, uh, what, what do you want me to pray for? She breaks down and cries. She says, she says uh, Preacher, uh, my sister, 
I've got four children. They belong to my sister. I had to take them away from her. She's doing sex in front of her own children and let older men come in and molest her kids. And now she lives with a 15-year-old boy. I can't let her have it, but I'm a single woman. I need help. Pray for me, preacher. Pray for me. I know we can get to the place we think we got our own problems, but how many is in this city like that? How many is in this city like that? How many comes to our churches and we have no idea how they're, what kind of battles they're going through? God, give us a burden for the lost of this city. Give us a burden for the lost. Don't let us get off track and get involved in a lot of other things. Get us back to the place where we can focus on what's the real and what's the important things of life. I want to fight the Lord's battle tonight. Hallelujah. 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 The Bible truly simplifies this whole matter. And I'm closing in just a moment. I want you to hear me. When it identifies the fact that we are in the redemption business. Amen. I remind our church of that constantly because we can become such a community within ourselves. We can start all kind of projects and programs. We can get involved in all kind of business and things that are all good and well. But it's not redemption business. Somewhere ago, years ago, I told everybody on our staff, I said, we are going to condense everything we do around here to fit in one little mission statement, and that's to get people and lead them into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Ghost. Nothing else is going to matter to this church. Nothing else is going to matter around here. If it doesn't fit into that little focus right there, then it's going to be discarded. Somebody else can handle that. But we're going to stay in the redemption business. We're going to stay reaching the lost. We're going to get our mind focused that Calvary is still effective. When we lift up the Lord Jesus Christ, it's still effective. It's still powerful. And it still works. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Hallelujah. Let me tell you about Bishop Richard Winky. Wilkie, I'm sorry. I've got his book. I've had it for years in my library. Methodist Bishop. I'm going to quote Methodist Bishop Wilkie. He was concerned and did an investigation because in a 10-year period, the Methodist Church lost two million members in that period of time. He decided, I'm going to find out why people are leaving the church. And he wrote the book, Are We Yet Alive? He crystallized our goals, our goals, as far as I'm concerned, so clearly that I'm going to quote him. He speaks on the book of Mega Trends. John Nesbitt uh, wrote this book. He comments about the railroads and says they were the most prestigious corporations in America. The Pennsylvania Railroad was chosen as the best-run corporation in the world. That's not true today, and you know that now the railroads are in disrepair and disgrace, he says. And what happened? He said those in charge of the railroads misunderstood the law of the situation. The law of the situation, yes, it requires that we ask ourselves what business are we really in. The railroad magnates thought they were in the business of running railroads. Wrong, he says. They were in the business of transportation. What could have happened if they understood that? They would have expanded and include trucking and airlines and would have seen a whole task as moving people and produce effectively and efficiently from one place to another. Many people believe that is our business, he says, and that is to have church and to run church. I've heard us say it, I have said it myself, to have good church. Thank God we have good church. But that's why he said we are in trouble just as the railroads were in trouble. Our job is not to run the church. Our job is to save the world. We need a new vision of mission, he says. 
Our job is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. Dear God, help me tonight to always remember, even though we've got wonderful people in our church, thank God for that. But I don't want to get off base because I am here uh, as a part of destiny. Amen. I want somehow for us to influence. My job as a pastor is to get our people on the front lines of missions. I want them to know that this world is lost without the Lord Jesus Christ. Dear God, help us tonight. Help us tonight to understand we're under direct authority from Jesus Christ Himself. And we have a mandate. We're not here just to have another little service at store conference. Do you believe that? I believe there's a reason why in 2013 we have gathered here in this building tonight. Because we're going to get refocused. One more time, I want to give all my energy and all my effort. I want to make sure that I do the right thing. Because I love Him so much. That's why... This wonderful mandate is so clear and unmistakable and eternal. When the Lord says in Mark 16 and 15, He says, uh, Go unto all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I'm trying my best. It's one of my top priorities as a preacher. Amen. 140 missionaries we sponsor. It's costly, folks. Yes, it's costly. Is it inconvenient? Absolutely inconvenient. But the reason we do it is because it's the Lord's battle and we're servants of the Most High God. I don't want to get involved in my own little world. I don't want to get involved in my own little personal problems. They're big. They're major. But nothing compares, I'm sure, to what David was going through. And yet he sees over here a need and says the Lord wants us to go over there and save that city. You can't be passive about your faith, my friend, and please the Lord. It's impossible tonight. The only faith that God accepts is a working, active faith. A church with barren altars is an affront to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I wish somebody would have told me that when I was just starting into the ministry. I'm closing. Uh, Musician, please come. Hallelujah. When Jesus came, this is what he saw. When he came the first time, and don't forget now, he's coming back soon. He's coming soon. Matthew 4 and 16, this is what he saw. He said, the people which sat in darkness. Why does a missionary leave his homeland and his family? Nobody in their right mind would do that, would they? It's because people sit in darkness. I've sat down here some time ago and thought about how wonderful it's been. My years have been blessed of God. I was raised by two wonderful, wonderful parents. Neither one was preachers. Nobody knew who they were. Really, but they raised me in a Christian culture ever since I've been born. Anytime there was a revival near, it didn't matter which church or whose church it was, they'd go to that revival and take their children with them. Special services and weekly services, and just on and on and on. But when I think about in some of the mission fields, There's millions of people. There's thousands of towns where you will never hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and not even hear the name of Jesus spoken whatsoever. Some of these cities are millions in number. I mean, I I can't take up the time tonight, but I'd love to talk about China. I'd love to talk about the key man that we have there in China. 
that if we don't keep him there, I don't know how we're going to be able to solve the situation. If you were one of those people and you woke up and wanted to hear about God, you're out of luck. There's no place to get it. There's no bookstore you can go to, and there's no church. There's no radio. There's no Internet. There's nothing. House Church right now just read this week, China is going to come down strong to destroy the house churches. The people sit in darkness. Is it fair to hear this gospel over and over and over again? And so many have never heard it at all. Joseph Stalin took millions under his rule and killed them. He bragged to President Truman how many million he had killed. Twenty million of his own people, Russians. People who lived in a land, the Scripture said, where death cast its shadow. Siberia. I think about that. So many have died that in some cities, they say, you can't use a shovel anywhere without digging up a corpse. For them, it's too late. I love the gifts of the Spirit. I love Holy Ghost anointed services. But if we're called to catch people, God help me somehow or another to lay aside my personal battles. Pick up the fight for the Lord's battle. Would you stand with me tonight? I need you, Jesus. Listen, everybody. Listen. I hate to say this. But the church in general has very little interest in catching people. Oh, no, no, no. We believe it. We believe it. I've never met anybody that didn't believe it. It's in our bulletins. It's in our hymns. It's in our sermons. Posted on our church signs. It's put in our statements of faith. But the irony is that though we have such a rich heritage and strong reputation for evangelism, in many cases, precious little is actually being done. Oh, if you go through the system, if you go through the system, you're going to learn about religion. You're going to learn about church entity. You're going to learn about church government, church polity. But it seems we do not stay with the part that is the Lord's battle and that's the redemption part God help me tonight when there's a little Kiala that I can influence that's encircled and smothered and besieged by the demons of hell help me Lord to rescue them Because that's where the promise is. If you go, I'll go with you. Would you close your eyes and just slip your hand up? Because I want the Holy Ghost. I want the Holy Ghost to speak to us. It's in these kind of meetings that men and women get a word of God for their ministry. It's in these kind of meetings that people have come with a hungry heart to the Lord will give a word and speak a word into your life. Do you feel that? Do you feel that? I know we believe it. I know we believe it, but we have to have more than a passive faith. God, help me to fight the Lord's battle tonight in the name of Jesus. Reach over to somebody that's praying. Let's just make this place a house of prayer right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, Lord God, don't let me leave without feeling that we're in the redemption business. Hallelujah, hallelujah. 
Don't let me get involved in a war that you don't want me involved in. Don't let me get involved with trying to fight for somebody else. Lord, when it's not my battle, but oh God, take me to the place where there's a Kiala. Let me be able, oh God, to follow thy leading. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray tonight in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Give us a burden, Lord. Renew our vision one more time. Bring us back to the focus of what this is all about. I know we're all involved with a whole lot of things. We're going through a whole lot, walking through a valley ourselves. And we're living in the day of the desert sometimes. But the Lord said, you can fight my battle and I'll go with you if you do it. I'll go with you if you do it. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Stop. 